Welcome to our online event, the latest research from TAS Lab. Today's program is brought to you by Parkinson's Community Los Angeles. Today, we are so fortunate to have with us Dr. Peter A. TAS, MD, PhD. I'm Angela Neff, PCLA board member. For those of you who don't know us, we are a nonprofit that supports families living with Parkinson's through free education programs like this one, online and in-person support groups, social events, and more. Today's conversation is brought to you by our generous sponsors, Abbott, Boston Scientific, Kiowa Kirin, Medtronic, and Supernus, and by important donations from people just like you in the Parkinson's community. If you appreciate our work, please consider making a donation at PCLA.org. Your donation is 100% tax deductible, so thank you in advance. We rely on your generosity to help us continue this important work. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tass today. Dr. Peter Tass investigates and develops neuromodulation techniques for understanding and treating neurologic conditions such as Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, dysfunction following stroke, and tinnitus. He has pioneered a neuromodulation approach based on thorough computational modeling that employs dynamic self-organization, plasticity, and other neuromodulation principles to produce sustained effects after stimulation. Can't wait to hear about this. Welcome, Dr. Tass. Thank you very much. Thanks, Angela, for the introduction. It's a huge pleasure to join you this morning, and I'm very grateful for the invitation. So I want to tell you about this, this entire approach and what it is about. It's about basically stimulating um, the brain in a way that the brain unlearns the production of abnormal activity patterns and also changes its connectivity patterns in a way that we induce long lasting sustained relief. In par Parkinson's is characterized by abnormal neuronal synchrony. Synchrony sounds nice, intuitively nice, because it um, sounds like harmony, everybody's doing the same thing. But the problem is if you, for example, imagine a company where all employees do the same thing, this wouldn't work. And the same with neurons. For neurons, it's extremely important that different neurons that serve different purposes should be free and able to follow um, uh, and, and to, to, um, to process in, the information they have to process. And therefore, synchrony can be really, it can really massively impair brain functioning if it's too strong and too long lasting. And since um, so the activity is close, uh, brain activity in general, neuronal activity is very closely related to synaptic connectivity, meaning the connections the neurons form. Um, Parkinson's is also um, characterized by abnormal synaptic connectivity. So at, as, a, as a consequence of the lack of dopamine, there's a cascade of, of uh, changes of both connectivity and uh, synchrony. You're, you're probably familiar with deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation is a was a, or the introduction of or invention of deep brain stimulation and its introduction to the Parkinson's field was a huge milestone treatment milestone. So what you see here is a Parkinson patient's right side, right-handed and right-sided Parkinson patients, 48 years old, was no longer to work. And he was one of the patients who really nicely um, benefited from the treatment. So the electrode is implanted here, the, the cable goes to the implantable pulse generator, and the important message comes now. So the, the, the IPG, the, the stimulator is turned off now. And you see the rebound effect. And in general, there's no long lasting effect. And this is what attracted me. I, I first started uh, with medicine. I got intrigued by self-organization processes, wanted to use these self-organization processes in a way to design um, treatments, effective, but nevertheless gentle treatments. And in the, in the early 90s, I got, uh, um, when I did my PhD in physics, I also studied maths and physics, and I did my PhD in physics in the field of oscillator theory, synchronization, 
I was uh, I was really stunned by the huge effect size on the one hand of deep brain stimulation, but also by the um, by the slightly weird type of stimulation patterns, stimulus patterns that were used because they were so physiological. It's a permanent high frequency type of stimulation. High frequency means more than 100 hertz. And in the meantime, we understand very well the limitations of, of deep brain stimulations. It's an, a very important treatment, but it has limitations. On the one hand, um, since there are no long lasting therapeutic effects, you typically have to stimulate for longer periods of time. And this, um, this leads to side effects. And in the meantime, there's even the, the word, the term deep, deep brain stimulation induced movement disorders. So depending on where the target is, where the electro stimulation electrode is located, different typical groups of symptoms of side effects emerge. And also deep brain stimulation is not good in treating all types of symptoms. For example, the so-called actual symptoms do not uh, typically not um, significantly improve. For example, actual symptoms are gait, balance, and so on. And other symptoms like speech, deter uh, speech or voice impairment may even get worse um, under DBS. So the, the approach, and this is just one slide, there's been a huge amount of work and many, many, many papers so far. Um, it's very solid stuff. It's mathematically solid, bio biophysically solid. The, the underlying principle is to counteract abnormal neuronal synchrony by desynchronizing it. So in other words, not suppressing it, not inhibiting it, but use a, um, let's say, more gentle type of intervention, just desynchronizing it. But this um, seemingly more gentle type of thing is way more powerful for a couple of reasons, and I'll explain this now. The important point is, even simple networks, and you can show this in simulations and math, mathematical analysis, even simple networks, neural networks with so-called synaptic plasticity, they can be in, in a stable, different, very different, qualitatively different stable states. For example, can, they can be strongly connected. You've probably heard of the Hebgen principle. It's neurons that fire together, wire together. So in other words, these neurons are strongly firing together. They have also strong synaptic connections. And here you see it's the time axis, and this is the neuron index, so neuron one up to neuron n, and it's a large number. And you see that all of them are firing more or less at the same time. So they're strongly connected in strong synchrony. And what you can do with desynchronizing stimulation is you can desynchronize them so that it, there's no coherent structure anymore in their discharge pattern. And, and that's the important point. This goes along with a decrease of the synaptic connectivity. That's very important. So you can think of it as moving a ball in an attractor landscape from one pathological attractor stable state to into the basin of attraction of a more healthy attractor state where it remains. And this is very different compared to standard deep brain stimulation. So our goal from the very beginning is to induce long lasting effects, not to suppress immediately abnormal rhythms, but to stimulate the brain in a way that the brain unlearns uh, its ability to produce massive abnormal activity. And we've developed a number of stimulation techniques and are uh, also currently further improving all them and optimizing stimulation parameters, taking into account different types of plasticity mechanisms like synaptic plasticity, structural plasticity, where it's not just whether uh, synapses get stronger or weaker, but whether the entire synapse, for example, vanishes. And coordinated reset is a technique that works in the following way. It's very robust, doesn't require difficult and sophisticated uh, calibration. If you have uh, an population of neurons, for example, like these, this bunch of balls, gray balls, each ball representing a neuron. What you do uh, in the case of standard deep brain stimulation, you position your electrode in a way that you can stimulate as much of them because you want to reach them. The mechanism, a mechanism of, of deep brain stimulation, standard deep brain stimulation, not yet really fully understood, but basically it might be some sort of inhibition or blockage, and you want to sort of suppress the activity. 
what we do is we use for coordinated reset, and this is in ways that we come to the viral tactile later. Um, we, we stimulate different subpopulations in a gentle way. The only thing we want to do is we want to cause a reset, meaning a restart of the rhythmic activity in all these different subpopulations. So, for example, if you have if you stimulate at different sites at different times, and the neurons are all in synchrony before we stimulate, what happens after such a coordinated reset, coordinated in time and space, is that the neurons are no longer in in phase their phases mutual phase difference is shifted and if this it goes on for a long period of time what basically happens is that they reduce their synaptic weights and so the strength of their connections and they unlearn their activity and this is how it looks like so we do not permanently stimulate but we have these patterns so it's a mixture of of periodicity and randomness. So you see um, the period, the underlying period, like a clock. And then there's a random type of se sequence administration. So the sequence uh, is randomized from cycle to cycle. There are off cycles where we don't stimulate, providing the neurons um, with sufficient time to do physiological information processing and also, and also exploiting the 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 desynchronized uh, the desynchronized state that lasts for a long period of time and this is how it looks like in MPTP monkeys so monkeys that are and this is sixteen fold velocity these are seconds that's a measurement cage where the monkeys mm -hmm. were in for about um, ninety minutes every day and these monkeys are rendered Parkinsonian by MPTP by neurotoxic substance that selectively destroys uh, dopamine production. So these monkeys only have between 5 and 10 percent of the dopamine producing cells left after this treatment. So they are severely affected. As you can see here, I mean, the monkey is basically always sitting. Some of them really had issues um, um, with, uh, with food. And um, the monkeys were not treated um, with any medication. And this little hat served to protect the electrode from being pulled out because otherwise the monkeys were pulling out the electrode. And we stimulated them only for two hours a day. That's important, only two hours a day. It was an externalized, so we stimulated them from an external stimulator, not implanted, because simply because of the implant, implantable generator was way too large for these little animals. And this is the same monkey after two hours of coordinated reset stimulation. So to our stimulation, and then brought back into this measurement cage. The measurement cage used the light barrier system, um, where where it was uh, that enabled to to measure the amount of movement production. And you see that also based on a quantitative analysis, there was no difference between. Uh, the, the monkeys after two hours of CR stimulation compared to normal monkeys when it came to movement production rate. And the important, um, and the importance goes on like this, and let me just, and this was also independently um, verified by a number of other groups. And this is just briefly, so these are all, non, these are, this is the amount of, uh, this is basically monkeys mobility. This is before the five days of two hours per day treatment. So they are, they are not mobile. That's the mean value standard deviation. This is during the days of the five days. And this is after these five days, two hour stimulation. And this is with classical DBS standard deep brain stimulation. And there's an increase. There's a slight after effect that decays within 30 minutes. And this is what we see with CR with this really low intensity, on purpose low intensity, because we have to stimulate different subpopulations selectively, and we have an after, significant after effect, therapeutic after effect for one month. And this was important um, on the one hand to move forward with in patients. And we've shown this also in, in externalized patients. Um, where the electrodes were implanted, the, the, the cables not yet, so the patient was stimulated by means through a portable stimulator. And this is how it looks like. 
So this is a 49 years old patient, Parkinson patient. She was also a right-handed person. She had a um, uh, dystonia for more than a year at that time. So the patient wasn't able to stretch her fingers. She was instructed to stretch her fingers, but it wasn't possible for her to do this. This was now directly before CR stimulation. And you see that full blown symptoms, tremor and dystonia. And um, we measured the EMG, muscular activity, accelerometer, EG, and so on. And this is about 20 minutes after turning on coordinated reset stimulation. You see the symptoms are gone. And remarkably also dystonia, because dystonia doesn't respond well when you use um, standard deep brain stimulation in particular um, when you deliver it to the SDN. And this was only unilateral stimulation. That's important. All our patients at that time were stimulated unilaterally for technical reasons. And this is the important thing. So this is now the situation one hour after turning off stimulation. And you see that the effect persists. That's the important point. And not only the clinical effect, but also, so rigidity was gone and so on, but also the abnormal activity. So this is what you see here. So the x-axis is the frequency axis. Tells you when, when you analyze the signal, and in this case, the signal um, in the brain, it's like a small EEG, local EEG, it's called local field potential, LFP. Directly at the, uh, at the site where, you, where we stimulate it, then you can, ask which uh, rhythm, which component, which oscillation, which rhythm uh, contributes to the signal. And that's a spectral analysis. The y-axis is spectral energy. And before stimulation, you see the one very prominent peak at around five hertz, that's the tremor associated peak. And this peak that's related to akinesia and rigidity. And this is after one hour after in total four hour stimulation. You see that these peaks are gone and that's very different compared to standard deep brain stimulation where this peak returns within 12 seconds and this one even quicker. And we've seen this in, in all patients. Uh, I don't want to go through unnecessary details. We've seen this in all patients and this was very promising. And also the effect size was very promising. But one important point was the following. If we are able, to, deli to deliver treatment that has long lasting effects. We have a chance to do this non-invasively because you can't wear, for example, a vibrating glove or any type of non-invasive device. Typically, you typically can't wear it and you don't want to wear it 24 seven. Therefore, this long lasting effect was um, a, a, huge a huge milestone in the development of the glove treatment. And there were predictions, also again, computational predictions that it should be possible to do this. And this is simply because the, the thing we use is um, we have, we, it's known since the 1980s of the last, uh, uh, so the 80s of the last century, it's known that we can reset, we can restart rhythmically active neurons by means of, of all sorts of um, stimuli, not just the electrical stimuli, also uh, thermal stimuli. And, and other stimuli. But the important thing is we can do this by stimulating the axon. We can do this by stimulating synapses. It's a very fundamental mechanism. We use this mechanism. We don't want to suppress neurons. We just wanted to restart different neurons at different times. So in other words, we want to manipulate the timing of different parts of a neuronal population. And there, there's a series of beautiful studies um, published by Lenz's lab. Lenz is a US uh, neurosurgeon, great uh, neurosurgeon. And what they've shown is the following. In order to understand different parts of the thalamus, because neurosurgeons really want to understand where they implant their electrodes, for example, for the treatment of Parkinson's, they've made the following observation in a very reliable manner. And they've done this in Parkinson patients, in essential trauma patients, patients with chronic stroke. And what they've seen in dystonia, what they've seen is the following. If we, um, if the electrode is in the, in the central hub for sensory inputs called ventral caudal uh, 
nucleus of the thalamus. So that's basically the hub that, that gets all inf proprioceptive information from the periphery, for example, from the hands, from the skin. Then, um, and we vibrate different parts of the body, it can also be the face. It's a very, very general phenomenon, needn't be just the hands. Then there are neurons that do not just um, randomly respond, so to speak, to the stimulus, but they respond in a rhythmic way. And the way they respond it, and their rhythms, uh, their rhythmic responses are tied to the vibration. So if this is the vibration, for example, neurons, vibra uh, neurons discharge, for example, in synchrony with the vibration. And this is shown here. So what you see here is one cycle of the peripheral vibration of the, of the skin and the y-axis is the percentage, uh, is, is the number of, of discharges. So if they assume that there were no, uh, in, no relationships between the discharges and um, the vibration, it would just be a noisy flat line. So, but what we see is this beautiful entrainment. So what this means is when we entrain different parts of the brain, we can control the timing of discharges. And that's what we need. We don't need to suppress neuronal firing and we don't want it because neurons have to be active in order to learn and unlearn their connections. We really want to change um, these networks. And, uh, and you shouldn't think of the brain as, a, like, uh, as an old fashioned computer that has hard wires, um, but it's a dynamic system that permanently changes. And also, I mean, I've, for example, um, in my presentation, my goal is to cause uh, a rewiring on your side and your brains in a way that you're able to memorize, hopefully memorize what I'm presenting. And now, why did we choose the fingertips? And this is because the fingertips have a huge representation. So what you see here is the homunculus. There also, there's also on the motor side, a more modern version of it, but the basic principle holds as uh, as published in many many years ago by Penfield, and that is the following: not all parts of the body do have the same cortical representation. So the volume and hence the number of neurons in the cortex, in the sensory cortex, and also motor cortex that are that are that process information from the skin of different parts of the body is very different. It's not homogeneous. Or so, for example, as you can see here. The hand has a huge representation if you, for example, compare it with the arm. The arm anatomically is a larger object, a larger part of the brain. But this uh, the, the, the fingertips and the hand are so strategically favorable simply because they're a small part of the skin, overall skin, but they have such a huge representation, beautifully huge representation. And that's what we want. We want to enter the brain in, in a non-invasive manner in a well-defined way, by means of this phase locking, by means of this entrainment type of stimulation. And we want to um, stimulate a hub part of the brain that is large, large enough. We can, we can induce a desynchronizing effect. And then, as we know from other preclinical, computational, and also clinical studies, desynchronizing effects typically propagate in the brain. So this is the basic concept. Uh, concept behind it. And so what we've done this, this is the first generation type of glove system. We have vibrators attached to all four fingers, to four fingers, not, not the thumb on both hands. And what we do is we simply replaced vibrations, 250 hertz bursts, by, um, uh, sorry, we, we replaced the electrical bursts delivered through depth electrodes by these vibrations. That's the important thing. So instead of implanting an electrode, delivering an electrical pulse, uh, electrical pulses, we simply use vibra vibrators, well-defined vibrators, and vibrating according to these well-defined spatial temporal patterns. We've done a three-month pilot study. We've done a number of pilot studies, and this, these, these are data from a three months pilot study. At that time, this was the COVID era. We wanted to do a, st a study in 20 patients and follow up patients for at least two years. But due to COVID, we had to stop 
hospital was closed and then fortunately re reopened quickly for medical care, surgeries and so on. But then later on, we were also able to, to restart our research. So it was, um, a th therefore it was a three month pilot study, it turned out to be a three month pilot study. All of the data you've seen here, you will see here and in, in the following slides are all um, exams um, may done performed after proper medication withdrawal so in order not to have any interference with medication patients had to withdraw their medication for between 12 and 48 hours and you see here the amount of mds as part three scores as i said off medication scores so the larger the number the more um, the more impaired the patient is and the mds as part three many of you will be familiar with this, covers all parts of movement production of the entire body from, um, from top to toe. And what you see here is that all of these patients, that's the mean value, that's the baseline. So patients came in, that's acute effects. That was the first visit day. It was a day visit day, um, the term, um, focusing on acute effects, meaning effects emerging after two times two hours stimulation while patients did not get any medication. So patients came in in the morning at eight o'clock, we did this exam, and then we had two times two hours and total four hours glove stimulation in between the two, the two times two hours in between a, a lunch break, and patients didn't get any medication. And then at around 3, 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon, we did this MDS UPOS part three, this motor, motor exam again. And you see that there's a significant decrease, although patients did not get any medications. And some of them are really afraid of staying off medication for such a long time. They significantly improved, statistically significantly improved. And this is the long term effect. And this is um, most remarkable and, and very encouraging. And that is, that's the following. So this is patient then came again for a first uh, treatment day visit. And we did the base, so-called baseline analysis again at eight o'clock in the morning of medication, and that's the mean value and uh, the, the standard deviation, so to speak. And then after three months, using the glove, four hours a day or two to four hours a day, patients came in again, and at eight o'clock in the morning, again, with medication withdrawal, um, this exam mode exam is repeated and you see this beautiful improvement although patients were off medication and this was super encouraging of course to change the brains of the patients change their conditions on long-term scale and that now the question is were these effects only statistically significant or were they also clinically significant? And if you want to talk about clinical significance, you have to use the so-called MCID, minimally clinically identified or difference. And the minimally clinically identified difference is a hurdle. In this case, it's minus 3.25. So a decrease of the motor score greater than 3.25 is significant. And the green data, the acute, uh, acute data, the acute improvement on this very first visit, and you see that all patients had an acute, um, in the significant, clinically significant acute improvement, except for patient three. And cumulative um, improvements after three months are the orange bars, and you see that all patients had a clinically significant improvement. And the other thing that's important is that typically patients had a, re a reduction of their medication. We did not instruct patients to reduce their medication. Patients um, decreased their medication, but of course, patients were able to decrease their medication if needed. And several of them were happy to reduce it because of side effects that were, um, that were um, bothersome to them. So we, what we've seen is a decrease of the medication. And another finding that was also really surprising to me, didn't expect it to be that pronounced because it's not so easy to detect Parkinson's related abnormal rhythms on the cortex and surface of the brain. Um, in the depth, in depth electrodes, it's, it's, it's easy 
and they're very pronounced and you can see them by, by a simple visual by simple visual inspection but in the cortex they, it's it's more integrated it's more complicated more sophisticated and what you see here is these are all patients off medication again after medication withdrawal before the treatment and 30 and, and, and sorry three months after the treatment the love treatment and you see the um these are the primary motor and primary sensory cortex so the sensory motor cortex the primary target for our treatment and what you see color coded is the power in this high parkinson's related to very typical high beta band between 21 and 30 hertz so we tested all frequency bands we didn't find any significant change compared to baseline and three months of um, glove treatment but this parkinson's related beta band had a huge decrease showed a huge decrease of the power that was very encouraging because we didn't expect it to be so pronounced and so we, we did not only see a clinical substantial improvement after medication withdrawals but also an elect from an electrophysiological standpoint and as improvement then we had a couple of case re, uh, case series studies and what you see here is again the x-axis is data of treatment glove treatment and the y-axis is again the motor score and it was an off medication again after med with medication before off medication motor score what you would expect in a parkinson's patient um, if you think of the time axis here time time ranges here this is about nine months is that you would expect that Parkinson patients get worse over time because of the underlying condition and degeneration and the progress of this degeneration. What we've seen here is a linear decrease in all of these patients. And for example, these, this patient, this is about half a year, and this patient was stimulated for half a year, two to four hours a day, one month pre-planned pause, and then again, six months. We have... Um, we were able to follow up due to COVID, unfortunately, only um, not in person, but we were following up three patients remotely that were going through this regimen with um, six months, two to four hours, and then one month pre-planned pause, and then uh, in total six month um, a maintenance dose or a low dose, only two to three to, uh, times two hours a week, so not much. And all of them had after effects, really lasting after effects for at least one up to one and one point five years, and still feeling better than uh, they were before. So all this is very encouraging. What we of course need is um, very solid testing, also against placebo effects. There are many reasons why we don't um, believe that these are placebo effects, because placebo effects typically are not that systematic. The placebo effects um, vary in time. Placebo effects rarely last for a very, very long time, and tremor does not typically respond to placebo effects. And we have in all our patients, in these patients and all the other patients, the tremor subscores were always significantly decreased. But nevertheless, and I'll come back to this later, we'll do proper um, uh, controlled trials also with placebo, meaning sh so called sham stimulation groups. And in order to provide you um, with, I'd like to provide you with some patient videos because these are just numbers or dots and patient videos tell um, more comprehensive um, stories. And this is one patient and he was diagnosed in 2007. He took a quite, quite, some, quite a large number of, of uh, Parkinson's pills. It was about 50% in off time every day. Um, often lying in bed, often he had lying in bed simply because he was so stiff. He used a cane, was supposed to use a wheelchair because he was falling increasingly often. This was July 2018. And if I'm uh, and yes, unfortunately, you're familiar with these. Um, the typical symptoms. So there's a slowness of movement. It's difficult for Parkinson patients to enter or exit rooms, change direction, turn around. The facial expression, the amount of facial expression is decreased. Arms are not swinging.
and patient came to us in August 2018 and told him there was no instruction to reduce medication. So the instruction was to use as much meds um, uh, as, as, as required to feel as, as well as possible. And this is the patient after in total two times, two hours a day on the first evening. And you see this pronounced change. You see the, originally he's smiling again. So the fa their facial expressions, there are large steps, the arms are swinging, he went down to from between 20 to 25 to six. And basically this is, this was his, um, uh, his, his level for a long period of time then. And then this was the sixth day of vibrotactile stimulation. He was an outpatient, uh, He came to, a, to, the, to the outpatient visits during three consecutive days and then continued stimulating at home. And he was able to start restart working. And the interesting thing is that he, he was the first patient who alerted us because he told us that he was noticed an improvement of his sense of smell and taste. And um, we didn't expect this uh, to be very uh, open. Um, and therefore, we didn't we did not systematically study this. We have a study that will start early next year. We will start. Uh, we will study improvements of olfaction and also vision, because that's something we have observed. Um, but nevertheless, it has to be systematically studied in um, by means of proper tests and so on. But this is something a couple of our patients reported. There was patients who had pronounced in, uh, olfactory impairment. And then finally, fortunately, this was only November 2018, the patient was able to run his first New York Marathon. And finally, also, he, he ran triathlon, so quite amazing trajectory, very happy extremely happy about this. And this is a patient uh, who had an early uh, onset patient was diagnosed at the age of 25. This is the first day came to us off meds prior to vibrotactile treatment. And he, uh, while having sort of um, an athletic type of um, shape patient, I mean, because, simply because of the huge amount of workout he did, he had huge, um, issues because of balance issues, tremor issues in the right side and was scheduled for DBS um, in September 19, uh, 19. And this is the, the video he sent me after six weeks of vibrotactile stimulation. And he didn't need DBS since then. So for quite a while, this is another patient, and this this shows you, and that's quite encouraging for us because um, shuffling, balance issues, so-called actual issue, uh, actual symptoms are a huge problem when it comes to, uh, when it comes to medication, but also in particular when it comes to deep, deep brain stimulation. Um, and we've seen in in the patients, but this is of course something you have to verify in in larger cohort of patients. In the patients, in our pilot patients, what we've seen is that the effects of the glove treatment are very favorable. So patients really respond to this um, with respect um, to, to shuffling. So shuffling fascinations occur when patients want to, for example, exit a room, enter a room, change direction, change velocity, as you see now, for example, a patient is able to walk in a more stable way now, and then he has to stop and tries to get into normal walking mode. And we provoke it by asking to turn around in a narrow hallway. And that's what you see now. And for, patient, for this patient, it was really very difficult to properly walk, even on medication, even when he used his medication. And this is after three months, and that's also 
I think a nice illustration why we use these off medication um, exams. So where patients have withdrawn their medication for between 12 and 48 hours, depending on the half-life of the medication. This is we want to see how the patient, we want to study the patient's condition irrespective of um, medication. What you see here is that the patient has greatly improved. He told us that with medication, shuffling was no, lo no longer an issue. So he was really happy about it. But you still see that the left arm is swinging, right arm is not properly swinging. Also, the gait is not really symmetric. And then you see some shuffling when he turns around. And that's the reason why we do this off medication type of exams to really see what's the condition of the patient. And this is now after five months. And this is after six months of treatment and one month of pre-planned course. Let me let me finish in um, mentioning or explaining what we've done. We've, we've we've invested a huge amount of money and huge amount of work into uh, further optimizing it, the treatment. And in order to come up with a stimulator with with a glove system that is able to do what we what we actually want to do, we have a um, clear study, clinical research, and clinical study uh, strategy. We are currently restarting this uh, start, uh, start enrollment for patients in December, January for a couple of pilot studies. And these different types of pilot studies address different symptoms and different populations or subpopulations of patients, for example, late stage patients or early stage patients. And the new, um, the new glove system, and all this is driven computationally and also it's also relying on very fundamental physiological mechanisms that we use will have uh, will provide us the possibility to provide further improved stimulation patterns further and individualized stimulation uh, stimuli so it's it'll be calibrated to each single patient each individual patient will be personalized the elementary stimulus that we're going to use and um we'll uh, we are we are on a on a midterm type of perspective. What we are doing is we'll also set up. We are currently setting up for these pilots. Um, we're setting up um, models, mathematical models that, so to speak, mimic the patient's brain. It's like electronic twins, so that we can really learn how the elementary stimuli that we deliver change brain activity. And we measure these, um, the, the changes and the responses to the stimuli, both in our simulations and sort of, so to speak, in the electronic twins, but also in, of course, in our patients. And all this is about further optimizing the treatment and the cascade of, of studies is as follows. So we first start with a few very well-defined, very well elaborate uh, already I have I approved pilot studies not controlled so with no sham conditions so that we can nicely interact with patients ask patients without unblinding them for example ask them about how it feels how this different stimuli feel and so on and of course how they feel and then the next step will be an randomized controlled trials already I have approved uh, which will also be which will also start um, next year, so second or at latest third quarter, but I think second quarter, and then as soon as we'll get um, uh, good interim results, because there are many things to test, for example, also concerning placebo stimulation groups, sham effects, we have to, to test them whether we do this properly, then the real, we'll be able, and the investment is, is ready for this to, to come up with the large scale studies to that aim to provide, um, to achieve reimbursement as soon as possible. So this is our goal. And I'm super grateful that I have a fantastic lab 
people who are really um, working in a very dedicated, very enthusiastic way. Many, many good, super, superb neurologists, neurosurgeons, um, very strong funding, uh, unfortunately. And um, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Maybe we should start with this, Dr. Tess. I'm sure you're used to it. Everybody wants to know when it's going to be available, what, you know, what the timeline is. Can you, you started to go into the timeline. Can you very slowly talk about the timeline that you expect at this point? Yeah, the, the timeline, you see, I don't want to make any uh, inadequate promises or so. And um, it's also, it always depends on what, what you want to achieve, so to speak. And um, the goal here is is something substantial. So fortunately, I was uh, I was able to team up with people who are really extremely um, extremely competent in medtech and have done um, medtech approvals and FDA approvals and in particular reimbursements for many many times. And the goal here is not just to quickly achieve FDA approval and and so to speak, have some people make a bit of money, but um, do this in a in the most professional way in order to provide um, reimbursement, meaning access to treatment for as many patients as possible and as soon as possible. And one thing is um, that is very important here is it there are some unknown things that are risk factors. For example, just just as an example. We want to show, and that's that's important also for reimbursement, but also for for the neurologists to understand this treatment. Um, we want to show that the effects are certainly not placebo effects, and for this we have to do placebo control trials. When you have a sensory treatment, you can't, like, uh, for example, comparing to comparing it to a pharmaceutical treatment, you can't just take a pill, and one pill is the real treatment contains the substance, the other pill is the placebo, it just contains sugar, or whatever, something totally inactive. And um, this is not possible in, when you have sensory stimulation, you have to, uh, you have to come up with a, an inactive stimulation pattern, but nevertheless, the patient has to feel stimulation. And this is important because patients should not be able to unblind themselves and we know what we want to do, but we have to test this. And therefore we do not start with an FDA approval trial, but we start with first um, pilot, stu uh, pilot studies, also pilot studies where we test some of the basic ingredients of this sham stimulation. And the next thing is uh, a controlled proof of concept trial, which hopefully will start in second quarter of next year. And then and and then as soon as, for example, after let's say six months or something like that, an interim analysis will provide good results, an FDA approval trial that we're already preparing um, should start. And then it's difficult to tell how, how fast this will be because we are very large, very professional, professional, very large trial in many, many, many patients. And this and certainly not only one side, study side, um, and probably also not only in the US. Um, and this might take a year or potentially longer. So I hope that some like 20, 25, 20, 26 ish would be a time. At least this is our goal. And we are not delaying anything. It's not that we want to be unnecessarily slow or whatever, or over accurate or whatever. We're doing, we're working as fast as we can. And it's as professional uh, as it, I think, as it can get. And it's with people that do it in a very reliable way, with a very, very clear goal. And the goal is to provide all patients with this treatment as soon as possible. Great. Uh, this an interesting question. Somebody wants to know, when the stimulation is going on, what is the effect and feeling on the body? Yeah, what, what uh, our patients reported was that it's it's um, they it's a convenient feeling. Many patients report a relaxing effect, and when we, for example, tested the first stimulators, the first gloves in healthy subjects, at that time I was still in Germany before I moved to Stanford. 
all uh, institute members at that time tested the gloves just for technical reliability. And what basically everybody said was, and these were healthy subjects, is that it's that it has a zen type of effect, meaning it was relaxing, it didn't make you tired, but relaxing. And that's also what the patients report. We'll do a study where we specifically where we specifically analyze the relaxing effects, not only psychophysically or not only psychologically, but also by means of uh, EEG, meaning brain recordings. There's uh, one question, sorry, uh, sorry interrupt. Uh, I've seen, can a DBS patient utilize your device? Just briefly, we, um, in principle, there's no reason why this should not be possible. So what we what we'll do is we have, uh, and what you typically do, by the way, is the following. When you have such a question and you have a hypothesis and the hypothesis, our hypothesis, yes, should be possible. And then we have, what we do is we first do a, a pilot study and that's what we, what we're already planning. For example, we already have approval, IOB approval for, post-surgery, Parkinson patients um, that, were, that have no favorable outcome. For example, patients that had a lesioning treatment or a, an ultrasound treatment have no, not, um, no sufficient benefit, didn't have sufficient benefit from this treatment. And in these patients, we will try the glove treatment. And the same we'll do with deep brain stimulation patients. But before I can make such claim, that it actually benefits patients. We have to go through this usual sequence. We first try it in a pilot study. Then we go based on the effect size and, and the learnings in general, the learnings uh, obtained in the pilot study, we go to a controlled trial with sham so-called placebo type of stimulation. And then we can make the claim that it works. Someone asked about Parkinson tremor. Have you, um, do you have a subgroup that for people who, excuse, excuse me, not Parkinson's tremor, essential tremor. I'm sure you have lots of different kinds of people who are participating. I believe you said 10,000 people are- 10,000 people are on the wait list, yeah. Oh, on the wait list, okay. How no, many it's... people actually have um, for, for the next stage that will be participating? So far, we have about 35 patients, um, experience from 35, treating 35 patients. Next stage will be um, pilots, um, about 60, the first three pilots, and then um, 2002, 34 in the, in the control trial, and then the larger um, FDA approval trial will be a larger number, probably 100 or more. So this is, these are the current numbers. And your question concerning a central tremor, we, we absolutely want to, to test this treatment also in a tr essential tremor patients. Parkinson's is now highest priority, but essential tremor is definitely also a, a goal for us. And this is because um, we, have, we had patients in our pilot study, for example, we had a patient who had a pre-existing essential tremor, and then later on also um, presented with Parkinson's symptoms and the patient had very pronounced tremor reduction due to the glove, both concerning the essent typical essential tremor symptoms, but also the Parkinson tremor symptoms. Seems like you've had a lot of accidental good news through your studies so far. Yeah, fortunately, but there, there were some there were some um, some observations we definitely didn't expect, and we focused, of course, on the typical motor effects. And fortunately, um, we had. Um, quite promising very early and still to be confirmed in control studies, but very early surprising findings related to non-motor symptoms. Here's another question. I'm not quite sure I understand it, but you probably will. Do most of the neuromodulation researchers, specifically those who are using the vibratory approach network with each other, as in the Q1 of Charco Neurotech, I guess it's just about, do you have a large group of people who are doing similar research as you that you um, network with? No, not yet. No, not, not, actually not yet. Uh, I think this, uh, this is something that is about to start and it always takes some time. You see, I mean, if you, if you look, for example, at the, at the development of the deep brain stimulation um, research community, I mean, this also took years. 
initially it was focused on motor symptoms, then it broadened to other types of symptoms, cognitive, memory related uh, symptoms and, and also um, emotion, uh, emotional limbic symptoms and so on. But um, this, this will take some time. However, concerning the, um, the underlying research, the computational research that's driving our field and our approach, I collaborate with, with several groups. I've, I've um, PhD students also at other universities and so on. So we are out of time, but the million dollar question is, when, when is the updated timeline for the glove to come to market? Um, if all things go continually go to smoothly, is that like two years, three years? Well, my hope is, but I can't, I, I cannot, I don't want to overstate or over promise or whatever. And okay. there are some things that you cannot, can never, can never um, predict uh, adequately. But what I hope is that 2025, 2026. Okay. I think that's a realistic number. I, that's, I know that was a tough question to ask, but everybody wanted to know the answer. So I had to ask it. So thank you again, Dr. Tass, and thank you for all for joining us today. Today's event was made possible by our sponsors, Abbott, Boston Scientific, Kiowa Kirin, Medtronic, and Supernus. We have some wonderful events coming up, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But if you enjoyed today's program, please visit PCLA.org and make your donation today. By donating to PCLA, you can join us in our mission to improve the lives of families in our community living with Parkinson's. You can find our contact information at the bottom of this screen. PCLA is a nonprofit and all donations are tax deductible. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Tass.